As civilizations were emerging in Mesopotamia, Egypt, and South Asia, fascinating and even unique civilizations were also being established in East Asia. I say unique because despite the fact that in many ways the evolution of agrarian civilization in that part of Eurasia mirrored what happened in other regions, the relative geographic isolation of East Asian civilization enabled it to develop some original and fascinating ideas about government, society, and the role of the individual. So let's begin our exploration of East Asian civilization with a consideration of the geographical and environmental characteristics that enabled these original ideas to emerge. When I use the term East Asia, I'm referring to a huge mainland area dominated by China and also the Korean Peninsula, the long archipelago of Japan, and the thousands of other islands that populate the Yellow and South China Seas, including Taiwan. China is an enormous country with a total land area of more than 3 million square miles, with land borders 13,500 miles long, and a coastline almost as long at 11,000 miles. China is the third largest country in the world after Russia and Canada. Given its great size, it is hardly surprising that China has a tremendous variety of topography, climate, and vegetation. This can most easily be grasped if we divide the country into four key regions, the eastern plains, the northern grasslands, the southern hill regions, and the mountainous and arid west. The eastern region consists of densely populated alluvial plains that have been built up by China's two great river systems, those of the Yellow River, or Huanghe, and the Yangtze, which the Chinese call the Changjiang. It is within these eastern plains that much of China's long history has played out. Here is where the first farming cultures and cities in East Asia appeared, and where all of the ancient dynasties were located. To the north of these plains, along the edges of the Mongolian Plateau, lie extensive steppe grasslands, an environment particularly suited to pastoral nomadism. Many powerful nomadic confederations did indeed establish themselves in this region, and as was the case all over Eurasia, the interaction between nomads and sedentary farming cultures added considerable dynamism to early Chinese history. The southern regions of China consist mostly of hill country and low mountain ranges that receive extensive rainfall up to 60 inches a year in some places. This region is particularly suitable for rice cultivation, which grew naturally in the wild in the shallow tributaries and estuaries of the Yangtze River Valley catchment. It was later domesticated by early farmers so successfully that it has been the staple food for untold millions of Chinese people ever since. The fourth major geographical region of China is the mountainous and arid west, a place where the, the slow motion tectonic collision of the Indian and Eurasian plates has produced tremendous mountain ranges like the, the Himalaya, the Karakoram, and the Tian Shan. These mountains were a formidable barrier to communication between China and the rest of Eurasia, partly because there are very few easy passes through them, and also because the mountains are interspersed with some of the harshest deserts on Earth, like the Gobi and the Taklamakan. This combination of geographical barriers has meant that for much of its ancient history, China was protected from competing civilizations in the West. So China was never actually incorporated into anyone else's empire until Europeans and their gunboats turned up in the 19th century. This also meant that China experienced little cultural influence from the early civilizations of the Indus, Mesopotamia, or Egypt, which in contrast had engaged in high levels of trade and cultural exchange almost from the beginning of their history. For centuries, China's occasional contact with the militarized nomads on its northern and western borders were its primary cultural conduit to the outside world. This relative isolation forced China's early dynasties to, to focus on internal cultural and ethnic integration rather than on external expansion. Probably the most significant geographical feature of all in understanding the emergence of civilization in China are its two major river systems, essentially two different cradles of East Asian civilization that have tended to divide China into two distinct cultural halves. The southern regions are dominated by the mighty Yangtze River, the third longest in the world after the Nile and the Amazon, supporting some 500 million people in its vast catchment zone today, as it flows nearly 4,000 miles from the Tibetan Plateau to the sea. 
In the north, the nearly 3,000 mile long Huang He is called the Yellow River because of huge amounts of silt, actually yellow mineral rich soil known as loess, that it carries out from the plains into the sea. It was in the valley of the Huang He, rich with fertile soil and abundant river water, that the earliest settled communities and cultures of East Asia appeared. Archaeological evidence shows that by 7000 BCE, farmers had learned to domesticate a, a drought resistant and very nutritious wild grass called millet. As we have seen, wherever the transition to agriculture was successfully made, sedentary populations increased until by 5000 BCE, hundreds of villages were flourishing in the middle Huang He Valley, growing millet, soybeans, mung beans and hemp to make clothing and depending on domesticated pigs, cattle, sheep and ducks. The complex farming culture that operated in these villages is known to archaeologists as the Yangshao culture, identified through its very fine painted pottery and distinctive bone tools. Some 200 Yangshao villages have been excavated by archaeologists, but the first and still probably most significant was discovered in 1952 at Banpo, not far from the modern Chinese city of Xi'an. At Banpo, excavators uncovered well-constructed pit houses dug about three feet into the ground to provide stability and warmth with sides and roofs made of thatched vegetation. And also cemeteries in which the dead were buried with various useful household objects, suggesting some sort of a belief in an afterlife. This evidence also suggests that Yangshao communities were relatively egalitarian. Although men held economic and political power in the community, we can tell from the, the types of goods found in male and female graves that women also had relatively high social status. I will have more to say about the ambiguous nature of early Chinese gender relations in a few moments. As populations continued to increase and society became more complex, a new and more sophisticated agrarian culture emerged in the Huang He Valley after roughly 3000 BCE which archaeologists call the Longshan culture. The Longshan were responsible for the domestication of a new species that was destined to have a significant impact on world history, the silkworm. By sometime around 2700 BCE, and perhaps even earlier, the Longshan people had learned to unwind silk from the cocoon of a very special species of silk moth caterpillar and spin this into fibre they could use for weaving cloth. Longshan settlements were larger than Yangshao villages and several of them were walled, evidence perhaps of increasing conflict between settlements or more probably with militarised nomads to the north. Longshan craftsmen made significant advances in pottery, uh, manufacturing, using a wheel to throw the clay on and both bronze metallurgy and jade carving also appeared in some tombs, evidence of increasing social hierarchy. The absence of any early irrigation structures suggests that rainfall was sufficient for growing crops, uh, surmise supported by the discovery of canals to control flooding along the Huang He. But between 2500 and 1500 BCE, the climate of the Huang He Valley gradually changed from warm and humid to cooler and more arid. This led to significant population increase in the heart of the Huang He Valley as early farmers were forced to migrate into the still sustainable areas from increasingly arid regions further afield, similar to the process that occurred in the Indus Valley. Early in the second millennium, a new culture appeared in the Huang He Valley, a culture that has been tentatively identified with a dynasty named the Xia in certain ancient Chinese texts. One such text is the Shizhe, the first ever history of China, completed by the wonderful early Han Dynasty historian Sima Qian in the 2nd century BCE. Before we discuss evidence for the Xia, let me say something about the meaning of the word dynasty here, the administrative structure that would now essentially dominate Chinese and East Asian history for the next 4,000 years. Politically, a dynasty is a succession of rulers who come from the same family or clan for several generations. But the term also describes the, the chronological era during which the family or clan reigned, as well as all events, developments and material culture artefacts that appeared during that period. So we talk about Zhou Dynasty philosophies, or Han Dynasty iron, uh, Ming Dynasty vase, and so on.
For centuries, Chinese scholars assumed the Shak dynasty to have, to have been only a legendary creation of early authors like Sima Qian. But archaeological discoveries made in 1959 at the site of Urlatau near Luoyang gave material support to the stories. The impressive evidence found at Urlatau included what appears to have been a palace, along with sophisticated bronze technology and jade carving, has persuaded more scholars that Urlatau may have been the capital of the Sha, the first dynasty ever to rule China, although there is still disagreement on this. We know little about the Sha, but a lot more about the succeeding Shang dynasty, whose more than 500-year rule between 1600 and 1045 BCE is supported by an enormous amount of evidence. The Shang controlled a large territory, much larger than that of the Sha, and were responsible for so many significant advances in governance, technology, writing and urbanisation that they are deservedly credited with establishing many of the core foundations of East Asian civilization. The powerful Shang kings claimed divine descent and attempted to communicate with their dead ancestors for guidance. They also instituted a hereditary succession structure. The kings seemed to rule by fiat, issuing binding decrees. No actual law codes from the Shang period have been discovered. Shang peasants had few rights and lived generally oppressed lives. Mostly they did not even own their farm plots, but cultivated those owned by wealthy elites in return for some measure of security and the right to keep some of the food. The peasants were also subject to regular conscription by the state to provide military service or to work on large public works programs. The Shang also had a slave class consisting in the main of enemy warriors captured in battle. The Shang kings practiced large-scale human sacrifice at the time of their burials, and it was often slaves who were sacrificed during the great royal funerals. Sometimes they were killed first and then buried. In other cases, they were buried alive. All this demonstrates that the Shang had established a, a rigid pyramidal society with the king on top, followed in descending order by the members of his family, a noble class, court officials, local aristocrats, peasants and slaves. As was the case in Mesopotamia and Egypt, with the increase in the size and complexity of the state and the requirement to keep records, scribes and other administrators were able to use their skills to obtain enhanced position and status. Another important element that emerged in Shang society has parallels with ancient India, the role of the extended family. This became particularly influential in Chinese society because families venerated both their living and their dead ancestors. They believed that the spirits of ancestors passed to another realm from which they could protect their surviving family members if the descendants showed them proper respect. So family solidarity meant that the living and the dead worked together to ensure prosperity. The Shang demonstrated a high level of sophistication in bronze metallurgy, which was exclusively reserved for and monopolized by the royal family and other elites. Its production was highly organized, involving a series of specialist groups to access the raw resources, transport these to production facilities, and then craft the metal into axes, spears, knives, and arrowheads, and also to create superb vessels for both everyday life and for state rituals. The Shang kings moved their capital city several times. At least five different capital cities have been discovered, and these constitute the first cities in East Asia. Although they were nowhere near as large and densely populated as the early cities of Mesopotamia, they were nonetheless impressive, particularly Yin near Anyang, which is probably the last Shang capital. Archaeology uh, allows us to compare the urban planning of Shang cities with those established by other ancient civilizations. As was the case with Mesopotamian cities, at the heart of all Shang cities were royal palaces and substantial temples with altars built up on rammed earth foundations. The largest of these measured 26 by 92 feet in area. Surrounding the central ceremonial core were industrial and craft production zones where bronze workers, stone and jade carvers, potters and other artisans lived and worked. Beyond this zone were suburbs full of small houses for agricultural workers and at the very edge of the city were the burial grounds. 
Despite these many achievements, perhaps the most important contribution of the Shang to subsequent Chinese civilization was the invention of the first writing system in East Asia, one of the key thresholds of complexity that had to be crossed by all ancient agrarian civilizations. The roots of Chinese writing probably extend much earlier than the Shang, but we have little to no evidence of this. The meaning of distinctive marks found on much older pieces of pottery, for example, is much debated by historians. The oldest actual evidence we have of writing in China comes from the Shang period, and unlike in Mesopotamia, Egypt or the Mediterranean region, it is not a system of accounting. Interestingly, the earliest Chinese writing was used as a means whereby the, the kings and their elites could communicate with the gods by writing questions on animal bones, the so-called oracle bones. These oracle bones are the, the shoulder blades of oxen or sheep or the undershells of turtles. For centuries, peasant farmers working in fields near Anyang had been digging these magical bones up in their fields and calling them dragon bones. Chinese apothecaries assumed them to have some sort of medicinal power, so they were ground into powder and used to treat a variety of ailments, including open wounds and stomach complaints. Eventually, early in the 20th century, they came to the attention of scholars who moved quickly to stop the, the drug trade and preserve these priceless records of the Shang dynasty. More than 100,000 oracle bones have so far been discovered. During the Shang dynasty, the bones were inscribed with, with questions that the court wanted to ask their dead ancestor spirits. Will we have a bountiful harvest this season? Should the king launch an attack against his enemies? Will there be any disasters in the next few weeks? And so on. After inscribing questions on the bone or shell, the diviner would heat it until it split into a network of cracks, which the diviner interpreted as the response from the ancestor spirits, often recording the interpretation on the bone. Of the more than 2,000 characters inscribed on the oracle bones, most of them have a modern recognizable counterpart, which means that, unlike cuneiform or hieroglyphics, the Chinese writing system that emerged under the Shang has been in continual use for more than 3,000 years. This writing system began as pictures or pictographs, but it quickly evolved into a logograph system that used symbols formed by two different elements. One element describes the meaning of the symbol, while the other element gives some hint as to how this symbol should be pronounced. However, over the millennia, these ancient sounds have changed considerably so that it is virtually impossible today to know how the ancient Chinese pronounce some of their characters. This logographic writing script that emerged fully developed during the Shang period was also fiendishly difficult and required many years of study to master. It led to the emergence of a highly educated literary elite which went on to become the scholar-bureaucrat class. These were the great Confucian scholars who came to dominate subsequent Chinese and East Asian government and culture. Even today, a well-educated Chinese reader needs mastery of somewhere between 5,000 and 7,000 characters, and knowledge of around 3,000 characters is necessary just to read a standard mainland Chinese newspaper. No wonder the early scholars who learned to master this challenging system soon acquired great respect and power in ancient Chinese society, similar to the powerful scribal classes that also appeared in Mesopotamia and Egypt, although frankly the difficulty of the Chinese written language was on another level altogether. Evidence contained on the oracle bones, along with other archaeological discoveries, also provide tremendous insight into gender relations during the Shang dynasty. Of the 700 or so personal names recorded on Shang oracle bones, 170 of them are women's names, which seems to suggest that this was a, a relatively gender egalitarian society, at least amongst the elites. Of particular interest was the discovery in 1976 of the tomb of a, a very intriguing elite woman, Lady Fu Hao. Lady Hao lived around 1200 BCE and may have been one of the wives of King Wu Ding because she is mentioned in several of his oracle bone inscriptions. According to these inscriptions, she was an extraordinary woman. She supervised state rituals, had her own estate outside the capital, and personally led military campaigns, including an army of 13,000 troops against the Qiang barbarians in the West.
Lady Howe's tomb was only small and intriguingly was not located within the confines of the Royal Cemetery, but it was filled with an astonishing array of artifacts. As one of the few Shang tombs so far discovered that was not robbed sometime in the ancient past, it has provided a rich treasure trove for archaeologists. Sixteen humans were sacrificed at the burial, including men, women and children, and the tomb contained 460 superb bronze objects, 750 jade objects, 70 stone sculptures, 500 hairpins and nearly 7,000 cowrie shells, probably used as money during the Shang Dynasty. In every way then, this is evidence of an extraordinary and powerful woman. Yet, despite Lady Howe's wealth and eminence, one of King Wu Ding's oracle inscriptions notes that she was unlucky in childbirth because she gave birth to a girl. It's a reminder for us of just how ambiguous evidence about ancient gender relations can be. The Shang kings used their strong military to suppress other regional powers and to demand tribute and slaves from rival states. But ultimately, they were unable to deal with the increasingly powerful Zhou state, which controlled the Wei River Valley in the west. In time, the Zhou military came sweeping out of the Wei Valley and destroyed the Shang after accusing the last Shang king of being a criminal obsessed with women, wine and tyranny. The beheading of the Shang king in 1045 BCE marks the end of the Shang and the beginning of the Zhou dynasty, which would go on to rule China for the next 800 years. The arrival of the Zhou marks a new phase in the way elites validated their violent seizure of power. The Zhou promoted the idea that there was a, a parallel between affairs on earth and affairs in heaven, and that divinities in heaven had the ability to bestow power upon terrestrial political regimes. Indeed, the Zhou claimed to have received the mandate of heaven, arguing that heavenly support was bestowed or withdrawn as a direct result of the quality of leadership. So long as leaders ruled conscientiously and ethically and observed all rites and rituals necessary for the maintenance of order, they would continue to enjoy the mandate. Ineffective leadership would unsettle not just the earthly realm, but indeed the entire cosmos and the divine powers in heaven who sit in impartial judgment over the affairs of the world would have to withdraw their support. This mandate of heaven political theory articulated by the Joe, just the latest in a long line of experiments in governance we have observed, became a mechanism for validating the power of successful dynasties, even those formed by a coup d'etat. It would go on to dominate Chinese imperial politics for the next 3,000 years until the abdication of the last emperor in 1912. Because the territory of the Zhou state was much larger in area than that of the Shang had been, the Zhou put in place a decentralized administrative structure in which local leaders were allowed to rule their own kingdoms so long as they supported the Zhou with tribute and troops. For several centuries, this structure worked surprisingly well, but eventually, regional leaders amassed enough power to set up their own bureaucracies and military forces. Iron metallurgy had begun to spread into China after the 9th century, so that over time, regional armies became better armed and more, with more lethal weapons, and also became less inclined to support the weakened Zhou royal family. By the 8th century BCE, all sense of unity had disappeared and widespread conflict broke out between the regional kingdoms, conflict that was destined to last for the next 500 years. This half millennium of civil warfare in China is divided into the spring and autumn period during which the state was especially fragmented and the aptly named Warring States period in which seven states contended for dominance. These were tumultuous historical eras in which nevertheless important social, technological and philosophical advances were made, further evidence of the critical role of conflict in promoting innovation. Socially, it now became possible for land to be purchased rather than just inherited, which meant that a, a wealthy merchant middle class began to emerge to challenge the inherited and hitherto unquestioned status of the nobility. The peasants were excluded from all this, of course. They were tied to their villages as tenant farmers of the elites and generally worked plots so small that there was no chance of creating a surplus. This was also an extraordinarily creative age for Chinese philosophy as intellectuals pondered the sorry state of Chinese affairs 
and considered the best way to end the almost continuous warfare and restore effective and ethical governance to the state. So many philosophers were active that the period has come to be known as the Hundred Schools of Thought, and a handful of these schools have gone on to dominate Chinese thinking ever since, notably Confucianism, Taoism, and Legalism. In an attempt to create a more ethical leadership class, a lower-level aristocrat from the state of Lu, Kong Futsu, better known as Confucius in the West, attempted to redefine the criteria for status in society. He argued that a superior individual was not necessarily someone born into a superior class, but someone who had attained the rank of Junsa or princeling through pursuing high levels of intellectual and ethical cultivation. Now, scholars have wrestled with the precise meaning of Confucian philosophy for the past 2,500 years because it is ambiguous and not clearly articulated in the key Confucian text, the Analects. On the one hand, the sage does seem to be offering an argument in favour of the, the maintenance of a hierarchical society headed by a noble class and is dismissive of anyone, anyone engaged in business or trade or seeking profit. As the Analects read, the master said, a noble man does what is right, a lesser man does what is profitable. But on the other hand, Confucius did seem to be advocating for a, a radical redefinition of status by pointing out that the noble man need not necessarily have been born into the aristocracy, but might attain his position through superior levels of education and higher moral standards. Men who had attained the rank of Junsa would thus have the intellectual and ethical capacity to lead by example and restore order and harmony to Chinese society. An alternative to the educational activism of the Confucians was the ideology proposed by the Taoists, who were more pessimistic about the ability of humans to construct harmonious, ordered societies. Not really trusting governments, the Taoists propose instead that humans need to modify and tailor their behaviour to live in harmony with the way, the great nameless, intensely creative force at the heart of the universe. Taoists assert that we need to detach ourselves from our immediate concern with the tedious and ultimately trivial aspects of everyday life and learn to live in harmony with the cosmos and with other humans in civil society by retreating from engagement with the world of politics and society. It was human striving, ambition and activism that had brought the world into the chaotic warring states period in the first place, they felt. So the proper response was to cease striving and live as simply as possible. Attractive as both Confucianism and Taoism have been to East Asian people ever since they first emerged some 2,500 years ago, it was a very different philosophy that ultimately succeeded in reuniting China. One of the warring states, the powerful Qin from northwestern China, adopted the ideology of legalism, which insisted on achieving social cohesion through the application of strict laws and harsh collective punishments. For legalists, the foundations of a state's strength were the, the military and agrarian sectors, and they sought to channel as many individuals as possible into those occupations and away from socially useless professions like education, philosophy or commerce. Using often brutal legalist tactics, it was the Qin who finally succeeded in 221 BCE in reuniting China and establishing their own short-lived but astonishingly successful Qin dynasty. Their extraordinary first ruler was Shi Huangdi, whose success as the first emperor of China paved the way for centuries of stable rule that followed under the mighty Han dynasty.